I was about 13 when my family went on our annual trip to Poland to visit family. My mother and father both come from a small rural village about two to three hours away from Warsaw. It's an idyllic little place that's surrounded by lush forest and wheat fields. Life is different there. Everyone is very carefree and relaxed. Being the small place it is, everyone knows one another since everyone essentially lives on the same street. I'd made a bit of a reputation for myself there, being known as the American girl who visits in the summers, so whenever we would arrive, the whole village would know. I loved the attention. All the kids wanted to play. One of the townspeople I saw most frequently was Tomek. Tomek was a funny guy in his upper 20s who would work in the village deli store. He would always give me extra meat anytime my grandparents would send me out to pick up food or offer to show me inside the kitchen. I never took him up on that offer. The idea of seeing how my meat was made was too much for my 13-year-old mind, though I didn't know it at the time. Tomek had the reputation of being the town lunatic. He wasn't a stranger to the police, nor the villagers, as he was a bit of a petty thief. My grandparents told me when I got older that my grandfather had not once, but twice, caught him trying the doors of the shed and then excusing himself when caught as drunk or unsure where he was. Despite this, I had never had a reason to fear or avoid him. The village had a tradition called Gra Odwaji, which translates to the game of courage, and that fell in between the dates of our visits. On this day, the village children would be set into teams and then given items to find that were hidden around the woods or village perimeters. The event lasted all day and the group that had found the most items would win a prize. The courage part of the game would be trying to attain the golden item which would be in the woods and guarded by a few adults armed with water sprayers or water guns. The only way to get the golden item was to avoid being sprayed with water. If all members of a team were hit, then the team would lose the chance to attain it. My team consisted of my four friends, Ava, Eric, Bartek, and Powell. Our strategy was to get as many of the items around town and then try our luck at the golden object when it got darker, in order to be harder to spot. We got a lot of the items throughout the day, and worked up a good sweat after racing against the other children. Around 7pm, we'd obtained 12 items, and we were ready to try our luck at the golden item. We'd heard from the other children that the adults were being relentless, guarding the object with ferocity. The wooded area that was the same destination as the golden item was behind Eric's house. Therefore, he took the lead in devising the plan. Our plan was that we were going to split up into two teams. Eric, Ava, and Bartek were meant to grab the adults' attention and drive them away as far as possible, while Powell and I would sneak in and grab the item. Feeling confident, we headed into the forest as the sun was slipping from the sky. We followed the dirt path for about five minutes and then stepped off of it, following Eric as he navigated through the shrubbery with ease. He stopped us just as we reached a thick clump of bushes, putting a finger to his lips. He motioned for us to look through the gaps in the shrubbery and see the adults. It was dark now, so it was hard to see who was actually guarding the items, but we could make out four shapes huddled together chatting softly. Without hesitation, we moved into our plan of action. Our three friends navigated around and disappeared from our sight, only for us to hear their laughs and the voices of adults yelling to get them. Powell and I watched as the adults raced after our friends, all abandoning the area they'd stood around. I remember glancing around and getting ready to jump out of the bushes when I felt Powell's hand on my shoulder and saw him make a shushing sound. They might not all be gone. Wait a bit, he urged. We sat quietly, listening intently for any sounds. Then it happened. The slightest sound of something moving on the other side of the clearing. We couldn't make out who or what it was, so we stayed quiet, peering through the gaps of the shrubbery. Powell saw it first. 
he saw what looked like a dark figure crouching behind a tree closest to the clearing. We watched as the figure moved tree to tree, never stepping out from behind, just simply observing. Just as I was about to suggest that one of us should cause a distraction, we hear a yelp and turn to see another team approaching, clearly happy that there seemed to be no one around where the golden item should be. We watched as this small group of two raced around the clearing, but didn't pick anything up. I kept waiting for the adults to step out and spray the kids, but the figure remained crouched, half visible behind the trees. One of the girls approached the area the adult was, but she was busy looking up at the tree, telling her partner that maybe the object was put up on a branch. We watched as she began pulling herself up to the lowest branch, and I remember the way my stomach dropped, when all of a sudden, we saw the adult shoot out behind the tree, grab her leg, and start pulling her into the darkness of the forest. Her partner ran off screaming, leaving me and Pal unsure what to do. We watched Frozen in horror as the adult began covering the girl's mouth in some attempt to silence her. Before either one of us could do anything, Tomek came running up the path and threw himself onto the man. Pal shot out to help Tomek while I ran back to call for help. When I reached the backyard that was the destination spot for the end of the game, I was screaming uncontrollably in a mix of words that took me a few attempts to get out, that help was needed. A large group of men raced toward the forest while I hid in my mother's arms, waiting to see everyone arrive back safely. My friends, Eric, Ava, and Bartek, approached me cautiously and asked what had happened and why Pal and I hadn't come back. It had turned out that after Ava... Bartek and Eric had distracted the adults and drove them away. The adults had decided to end the time to get the golden item. They had assumed that everyone had a chance to try to get it, and they didn't want the kids wandering off in the forest after dark. One of the adults had already pocketed the item when they chased our group back towards the main backyard. My team had assumed that we would see that there was nothing there and would have returned as well which is why they didn't come looking for us. As I retold what happened, everyone in the backyard listened to me with wide eyes. About ten minutes passed, and we saw the group of men coming back, Powell walking aside his father and the girl who had been attacked in the arms of her assumed father. As they all approached, I asked Powell what had happened. As the parents gathered and talked in hushed voices, Pal described to us how Tomek had beat the guy bloody but let him escape when he turned away, surprised by the men that had arrived to help. He mentioned that there were still a few men out there scouting the forest for the guy. I had then asked the remainder of my friends why help was not sent earlier by the girl's partner that had run away screaming. Everyone looked at me with blank faces and then suddenly the realization hit me hard. The next event becomes a blur. It's a mix of me racing to my parents with my friends and asking about the girl. A frenzy of people calling out her name and begging her to come out. A whirlwind of everyone rushing to get their kids inside. And a mayhem of adults swarming together to go search the woods again and call the police. It's been eight years now and she hasn't been found. Tomek was one of the main suspects believed to be part of a two-man kidnapping operation, but backed out when he saw that too much attention was brought to the event. I'm not sure whatever happened to him, and I can't help but feel guilty that I didn't do anything to help either of those girls. I saw the girl run away. Pal and I were the last to see her. Sometimes when I see a child with braided hair, I get thrown back to that night and I can still see her braids swirling around her as her figure disappeared from sight. Her name was Dorota, and I hope she's alive. This happened a few years back. I was 23 years old, married, and had a stepdaughter. I'm a woman 
divorced from my now ex and don't see my stepdaughter anymore. But at this time, I was living with them, my cousin, her husband, and their son. We had a townhouse on a dead end that led to some train tracks in my hometown. The neighborhood was decent but had a lot of houses close together and was highly populated with children. There were usually toys, bikes, and skateboards hanging around on the sidewalks and the front lawns of houses. This included our house. We resided in the second and third floor of the house while our landlord's daughter occupied the first. Shortly after moving in, two tenants moved into the basement apartment, a middle-aged couple. They seemed alright but were eerily quiet at first. They started showing some signs of drug use and just started showing some odd behavior. For example, they would scream to the top of their lungs at each other over petty things like wanting a ride somewhere or not wanting to give the ride. They were starting to scare our kids. I had a bad feeling about the guy, John. In our state, we have access to criminal records. We can search anybody's state police record. I exercised that right and found out that this guy had a pending sexual assault charge against a minor. Now I was terrified scared of the kids playing outside, scared of the kids being in the same building as this guy. Weird things started to happen, like we would wake up in the morning and the kids' toys would be broken, not just broken, but destroyed. Skateboards would be completely broken in half, a wagon was completely mangled, and toys were thrown down an embankment we had behind our house. We all had a feeling it was him but we couldn't prove it. One day, the shit had hit the fan. Tension had already started to build. It was clear we didn't like each other, but everyone was so passive-aggressive about everything. Until this day. I was dropping my ex off at work while my cousin kept an eye on the kids while they played at the neighbor's house in their fenced-in yard. My phone rang when I was a few blocks away from home. It was my cousin. I remember her saying, I think we're going to have a problem. I asked her why and she said, John is throwing shit down the embankment and knocking over the garbage bins. My first thought was, those things are full. He must be making a fucking mess. And boy was I right. I pulled into my driveway to see all of our recyclables scattered across the edge of the driveway. It made my blood boil. I got out of the car and looked over at his door on the side of the house. I saw him throw something out of the doorway and we met eyes. As soon as that happened, I took that chance to confront him. I yelled over to him, What's the fucking problem? Why are you throwing shit all over the place? He didn't take a minute. He literally started charging at me, saying, What the fuck are you going to do about it? When he made it up to me, and was just about to put his hands on me, I punched. I punched this six foot five man in the face. It didn't exactly drop him, but it knocked him down. He fell back and kind of bumped into his van and fell on his ass in front of it. To put things into perspective, I'm five foot eight, and at the time I had some extra weight on me, so I wasn't a tiny little helpless girl. After this, he got up with a vengeance. He threw punch after punch after punch. So did I. I was starting to get weak. My arms felt like spaghetti and I couldn't see a thing. I could hear my stepdaughter screaming and my cousin yelling for help from the upstairs window. I wiped my eyes and to my surprise, I saw my other neighbor restraining John. He was still trying to attack me even after being restrained. I was bleeding badly. I didn't realize it right away, but my nose was broken. My four foot nine cousin was standing in my front yard with a metal chair over his head, and my stepdaughter was taken inside with my other neighbor's kids. John was just screaming at me, telling my bird shits in his house. I was just screaming back at him, calling him crazy, a diddler, and telling him nobody wants him here. It felt like a segment of Jerry Springer in between a KY Jelly wrestling match. I ran upstairs to look for my cousin's coward of a husband, and he was in the window calling the police. When I realized he was useless, I headed back out. John was gone, 
He took off. The rescue and police arrived where I was questioned, then taken to the hospital. I was released soon after and was about to head out to pick up my ex, whom hadn't even known what had happened yet. But I couldn't find my keys, my car and house keys. We checked everywhere and couldn't find them. I started feeling like John had stole them before he took off. But they were with my phone. Why wouldn't he have taken my phone? I called the police station and they informed me he was picked up. I took a shot in the dark and asked if they found my keys on him. I described my keys, green New York Yankees bat keychain and some other stuff. They confirmed yes, he did have them. They asked me if I would like to press further charges. I of course said yes. There was a no contact order but technically they could not make him leave the house. It was up to my landlord. My landlord kicked them the fuck out. Not before they could squeeze some stalking and harassing in, though. My good neighbors turned their security cameras on facing our house. One morning, his girlfriend was standing in front of the house, yelling up at us all kinds of nasty shit. When we watched the footage on it, what we couldn't see at the time was that he was standing right at our door. She was the bait. He was the hook. Thank God we didn't bite. We caught him doing other creepy shit like him crawling around my car. Not even doing anything. Just crawling around the car like a fucking cat or something. Some weird shit. They moved out and it was peaceful for the rest of the time we were there. I still see them here and there. Usually walking and usually looking angry. Good. So quite a few years ago, I was walking home from a trip to my local downtown with my friend when we noticed a 1990s black sedan moving behind us. We thought nothing of it because number one, we were literally across the street from the police station and number two, we were only a block away from my house. A few seconds pass when the driver pulls to the side of the road adjacent to me and my friend and rolls his windows down. He hesitated for a moment and then asked if we'd seen his cat anywhere around, describing a grey cat with green eyes. Since I hadn't, I replied, no. He then states he was hard of hearing and beckoned us toward his car so he could hear us better. My stranger danger senses shot up instantly, as my mother had just warned me about this days prior. My friend, being much younger, started to approach him. Luckily, I grabbed his arm just in time and quietly told him to stay behind me, since I was older. I told him that we would keep an eye out for it and to have a good day, but he asked us to approach his car so he could hear us. At this point, I was straight up panicking, so I quickly waved goodbye and walked towards my house. This is where it gets bad. We continue walking home, crossing the final crosswalk before my block. So I turned my head because I didn't see him pass us. Lo and behold, he's crawling along the road trying to match our pace with his vehicle. He began trying to get us to stop. At this point, my heart is racing. I was even more scared because I was responsible for my friend. We began running because this was truly terrifying. We didn't run long as I'm asthmatic and my friend was plus-sized so the guy didn't struggle to stay hot on our trail. After what felt like an eternity, we stepped onto my driveway, but oh no, he wasn't done yet. He began pulling into my driveway. Before we had a chance to react, he was in park and opening his door. Luckily my mom was able to see this part of the encounter, as she was in the kitchen, which had a direct view of our driveway. So she hurried out to meet us in the driveway and escorted us into the house. My mom came back to talk with him, but he panicked and drove off as fast as he could. Thank God my mom was there because we might not have been able to make it to the door before he snatched us.
Okay, so I'm 19 now, but this was back when I was 15. I had just finished hanging out with my then girlfriend. Me and her were walking a trail and hanging out. It was about 10 at night and she had to get picked up. We said our goodbyes and she left. It was about a 15 minute walk home. There was a road I could have taken, but I was lazy and there was a shortcut on a train track that ran through the woods. It cut the time by about five or six minutes. I started my short trek home. All I could hear was silence and the occasional chirp of crickets. The beginning of my walk, I felt good, but I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I shrugged it off as nothing, but then I remembered the woods I was in was known for a homeless hangout spot. Still, I trudged on, having already walked too far to turn around. But then I spotted a silhouette in the tree line. It was a man. I couldn't see him properly, but I knew he wasn't there for a midnight stroll in the woods. He came out. To me his voice was raspy and deep. I was only 15 and I was pretty scrawny, so this deeply terrified me as I was afraid of the dark. So this situation only added onto the fear I was already feeling. The hair on my neck stood up. The man started to run for me. I had chills running through my entire body. I ran. I ran so fast, but the side of the train track was all rocks, and it was at an incline. I ended up tripping and cutting my knees and hands, but I didn't look back. I got up quick and I ran all the way home. I got home and I slammed the door behind me. I ran upstairs to my bedroom and I got in bed as I was out of breath and pretty tired from the running. I had a window that overlooked the path to where I'd exited the tracks. Of course I looked out of my window. And there he was. I could see him behind a tree, staring up at my window. I shut my blinds. I couldn't sleep that night. Who knows what would have happened if he got to me. I never did see him again. And believe me, I never walked that track ever again. I'm not really sure where to start the story. I met this guy, Gary, through some mutual friends, and everyone I knew seemed to like him. He was a goofy kid with long hair, nobody you'd really think twice about. He started hanging around with some of my friends and I, and eventually he was part of my main group of friends. I was in and out of a long-term relationship, and at the time I was single. Gary and I flirted for a little while but I grew disinterested pretty quickly. I was mostly worried about ruining my small circle of friends and figured a fling with Gary wasn't worth that. A good few months into our friendship, I go across country with my sister and I'm away for around two months. During the months I'm away, Gary messages me constantly and starts saying some really possessive things to me and my sister. For example... One time I told him about how we were going swimming in California, and he told me he would kill any guy who saw me on the beach in a bikini. This was creepy, but I was 3,000 miles away and didn't think much about it. This is where it got really weird. He sent me a Snapchat saying, I'm going to do this for you. I didn't open it right away, so I clicked again, and there was already another picture. Him holding a chunk of his hair. The next picture, him with a mullet. The picture after that, half bust hair with tiny bald spots. The next one, completely bald. Then a blank screen that said, You made me do this. Then the following picture, and I'm not kidding you, he shaved his head and his eyebrows. I was in California and in shock and I called him. I was looking to comfort him, thinking he was obviously having some sort of a breakdown. I mean, he had absolutely beautiful long hair before this. Before I could even get a word in, he was screaming at me, saying this was my fault. He basically said I'd gotten into his brain like a worm, and it made him shave his eyebrows. I basically blocked him on everything at that point. I was across the country, and that was the last thing I needed in my life at that time. 
There were a few more weird things, but flash forward to when I'm back from my cross-country trip. We didn't have any classes together, but one of our classes shared a hallway in my school. I'd barely spoken to him since his outburst shaving his eyebrows. He stood outside my classroom door, staring at me, saying nothing. And I mean, blatantly staring through the door, not even trying to look inconspicuous. I went outside and told him to leave, and he said nothing, so I just quickly went back inside. When he stayed there, staring, I went out again and was a bit more aggressive this time. I told him to get away from me. He told me he wouldn't leave unless I gave him a place we could talk. I just told him when my period's over and to leave. He snapped at me. No. A place and a time. You better be there. I panicked and basically told him to meet me outside my classroom door at the time my class ends. I never did meet him. I left out the back door. I know this is getting long, but this is possibly the worst part of my whole situation with him. He was driving me home after all of this happened. He seemed less hostile and like he genuinely wanted to talk and apologize. And just to let you know, my house is around 20 minutes away. So we've made it almost the way home and he starts acting sporadic again. He asks me very calmly if he should drive at full speed into the speed limit sign. Before I can say anything, he turns his wheel going 70 miles per hour towards the sign. There's tears in my eyes, and he's just glaring at me, smiling. He continues his calm yet twitchy and sporadic demeanor, and calmly says, Ha ha, just kidding. At the last minute, turning back onto the road. At this point, my whole body is tingling and I'm about to cry, but we're only five minutes from my house. As he gets off the exit, something in him changes. He takes a long pause at the end of the exit and suddenly whirls his head towards me. You are not going home. I was stunned at first, but I argue with him and tell him he needs to take me home and that he's being crazy. Give me five good reasons why you want to go home. Obviously, I refuse to list reasons and start screaming at him to take me home. By this point, he's flipped around and gotten back onto the highway towards his house. I'm in full-out panic and plead with him to take me home, while the whole time he mumbles to himself. He kept talking to himself and saying things like, This isn't crazy, right? How bad is this? And then he'd answer himself, saying, No, no. It's fine. It's not that crazy. And the whole time I'm pleading for him to take me home in the background. There was 20 minutes of this, so I forget the exact dialogue, but I do remember this. After I started crying, he says, No, it's okay. I have to work, so I'll bring you to my house and I'll leave you in my room. If you want, I'll give you some art stuff. Would you like that? Some stuff to paint with. He was treating me like a child, and this is what really messed me up for some reason. It sounded like something a psychopath would say, and I stopped crying immediately. I was now cold and I barely spoke because I was trembling. He brought me to his house and brought me inside. He left immediately, and I was alone in his dark house, trying to take in what just happened. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. My phone was like at 5%. I called my sister, bawling, and she paid for an Uber, and within four minutes I was on my way home. After that, I don't know why I didn't go to the police. I guess I felt bad for him. Obviously, he was crazy, but this is the reason I'm writing this. All that happened a few months ago, and I've successfully avoided him until this point. But yesterday, an anonymous edible arrangement came. The card was completely empty and I called everyone in my family, trying to figure out who sent me an $80 basket of fruit. So I called the place and asked what the name was on the credit card. And you guessed it, Gary. Why? If it was an apology, why leave it anonymous? He had no intention of me finding out. It just doesn't make sense.
To preface and give some context, I'm a 21-year-old man who makes a habit of taking road trips across the US, and I'm not one who's inexperienced when it comes to hiking or dangerous situations. I've had people stalk my camp in Kansas and stare over my fire in Utah with a shotgun. Point being, I've had weird experiences, but none that have ever chilled me like this one. I was out hiking a trail in southern Indiana with a female friend of mine. It was around 90 degrees and muggy as all get out. The trail specifically is the Three Lakes Trail, and it's a little over 10 miles long and is circular, so it's nearly impossible to get lost. We had arrived early in the morning, and so there was almost no one in the park at all, save for a few parked vehicles. We'd been hiking the trail for about three hours and not seen a soul. Usually, I pay attention to my surroundings a bit more, and I'm cautious of people, just because of life experiences and the Creepy Encounters subreddit. But with good conversation and laughs, I was distracted. My friend and I are walking downhill towards a sharp left turn, when out of seemingly nowhere, a woman steps around the bend and starts hiking up the hill toward us with her head down. She was of average height, but much more muscular than the typical woman. She's wearing a sports bra, short shorts, and a backpack which has left most of her body exposed. Her tattoos are what first caught my eye. All across her body are these weird shapes and symbols that didn't make much sense. I didn't see anything that resembled a picture or English words. As she came within about 10 feet of us, she looked up and we made eye contact. That's when everything in me just froze up. Her face had similar symbols tattooed all over and in strings all over her face. Her eyes, though, are what I'll remember for a long time. They were just black sockets and in the shade of the dense canopy. I couldn't make out much about what it actually was. With how humid it was that day, I don't believe the dark sockets were makeup, and so I assumed that all around her eyes were tattooed solid black. On top of this, she must have had colored contacts in her eyes as well, as I couldn't see any white at all. With every horror and cult scenario I've ever had running through my mind, and her face chilling me to the soul, I blurt out good day for a hike. She just looks at me with this empty stare, holds eye contact, and walks by us. I've never been so shaken up from running into someone out on a trail before, and I hope to never see something like that again. It was late afternoon in a relatively busy grocery store. I was happy to find a parking spot not too far away from the entrance. I'd finished buying my groceries, and as soon as I walked out of the store, I see a man just standing around. Where my car was parked, I had to pass him in order to get to my car. I immediately feel something in my stomach that triggered me to walk in the opposite way. So I changed my course on a dime and try to make my way to the parking lot from a different direction. As soon as I crossed the street, the man started walking in my direction. Right away, my alarms are going off. I quickly pick up my pace, and so does he. At that point, my heart starts racing, and I pick up my pace even more. I keep looking back to make sure he knows that I see him. He's about less than ten foot behind me and closing in. So I look behind me. I notice he's trying not to look suspicious by looking the other way. At that point, I made a right into a space in between two cars, and thankfully lost his line of sight. I hid behind two cars as I watched him look around for me. I'm not too far away from my car at this point. I position myself so that I'm now behind him, and he's far in front of me, still looking for me. I get in my car safely and drive out of the parking lot, never taking my eyes off of the man, who was now just sat at the end of the lot on a curb as I drove away. Be safe out there everyone, and always be aware of your surroundings.
A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made damn good money delivering. I'd worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. I got luckier than I could ever imagine. One night I was working and had a double delivery to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank. The first order went smoothly. The guy gave me $50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still very light out. The chin I'd worked at had a Strive Company cars with the logo on it. All white sedans. I grab the order and go to the door to the apartment building. A young guy comes out, and a much bigger, older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed. The way he was looking around just made me very nervous. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was very wrong. I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door. As the first young guy looked around down the parking lot, craning his neck as if he was looking for someone, I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him, trying to keep calm. Then the first guy held a gun to my right temple. I also felt a poke on my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and keys. Now. The first guy growled, and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him my bank but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in. I gave him the keys, trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from behind my left. He had poofy hair and was about the same age as the first kid, the one behind me I hadn't seen yet. The big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car. Luckily I'd left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone. That's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my then five-year-old son who absolutely is my world. Please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him. Please. I lied. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. The car began pulling in and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one ran behind me, he dropped the gun in front of me. Standard issue 9mm, silver and black. Safety off. It looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran off with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid. Panic set in as I realized they could easily come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark. I collapsed. They'd taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold the phone to talk to 911. As she set down her kid, her boyfriend, I assume, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm colorblind and these guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank God. I had a full description of two of them. The poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work, but she stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator but I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriend's. Cops showed up and contacted my store, and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. 
All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork, and the 72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God, because I had worked at other stores that make you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug. He was to this day one of the best bosses I ever had. What I didn't know was that I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. We usually meet up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me his dad had given him a heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. And after the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him. He said yeah and handed me the phone. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him I'd had two shots. So he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far away. We get to the station. They had suspects in custody. I was needed to ID them. Three boys and a driver. They'd been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery. Speeding. The bolo had already gone out and they matched the description. They'd used the money to buy weed and gas and had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone. My phone was in the mix in the box. The police told me to grab my phone only, and I did. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have been completely reset. It unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again. Although my parental instincts kicked in, I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy. He was the one with the white shirt. The police went wide-eyed and told me he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement. That's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. We found out later he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy, despite having the gun to my back, was because I asked them to go easy on him, that he was a good kid who didn't want to be there, and he was the only one confessing. It makes sense, since he had even said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught. But the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday. He got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he made fun of me and was laughing at me. Seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behavior, and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like grin. All I could see was pure evil. This kid will commit more crimes. I have no doubt he will eventually end someone's life. You can see how cold he is just by looking in his eyes. He's evil incarnate. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers. I've never seen this kind of evil in my life, and I never want to see it again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out. I'm so glad I did because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court only had my old address and my mom didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years. It's only been four. He's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior. Overcrowding. And it's this coming February. I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know knows his face and name. If he tries anything, we are all ready.
but for his sake, let's not meet. To the woman and her family who helped me, I was a woman then. I'm trans. If you see this, please know my undying gratitude for you all. It was inconvenient for you, and yet you were still late to work to help me, and I cannot thank you enough. I bought Christmas presents for your daughter, but when I went to the landlord there to find you, he would move. I didn't want to be a creep and stalk you to your new place, but I'm glad you got out of that bad neighborhood. I hope your beautiful baby girl is doing well too. I would gladly meet you again to give you the proper thanks you deserve. From the Domino's Driver in Southwest Ohio. Okay, so I'm 19 now, but this was back when I was 15. I had just finished hanging out with my then girlfriend. Me and her were walking a trail and hanging out. It was about 10 at night and she had to get picked up. We said our goodbyes and she left. It was about a 15 minute walk home. There was a road I could have taken, but I was lazy and there was a shortcut on a train track that ran through the woods. It cut the time by about five or six minutes. I started my short trek home. All I could hear was silence and the occasional chirp of crickets. The beginning of my walk, I felt good, but I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I shrugged it off as nothing, but then I remembered the woods I was in was known for a homeless hangout spot. Still, I trudged on, having already walked too far to turn around. But then I spotted a silhouette in the tree line. It was a man. I couldn't see him properly, but I knew he wasn't there for a midnight stroll in the woods. He came out. To me, his voice was raspy and deep. I was only 15 and I was pretty scrawny, so this deeply terrified me as I was afraid of the dark. So this situation only added onto the fear I was already feeling. The hair on my neck stood up. The man started to run for me. I had chills running through my entire body. I ran. I ran so fast, but the side of the train track was all rocks, and it was at an incline. I ended up tripping and cutting my knees and hands, but I didn't look back. I got up quick, and I ran all the way home. I got home, and I slammed the door behind me. I ran upstairs to my bedroom, and I got in bed as I was out of breath and pretty tired from the running. I had a window that overlooked the path to where I'd exited the tracks. Of course I looked out of my window. And there he was. I could see him behind a tree, staring up at my window. I shut my blinds. I couldn't sleep that night. Who knows what would have happened if he got to me. I never did see him again. And believe me, I never walked that track ever again. So quite a few years ago, I was walking home from a trip to my local downtown with my friend when we noticed a 1990s black sedan moving behind us. We thought nothing of it because number one, we were literally across the street from the police station and number two, we were only a block away from my house. A few seconds pass when the driver pulls to the side of the road adjacent to me and my friend and rolls his windows down. He hesitated for a moment and then asked if we'd seen his cat anywhere around, describing a grey cat with green eyes. Since I hadn't, I replied, no. He then states he was hard of hearing and beckoned us toward his car so he could hear us better. My stranger danger senses shot up instantly, as my mother had just warned me about this days prior. My friend, being much younger, started to approach him. Luckily, I grabbed his arm just in time and quietly told him to stay behind me, since I was older. I told him that we would keep an eye out for it and to have a good day, but he asked us to approach his car so he could hear us. At this point, I was straight up panicking, so I quickly waved goodbye and walked towards my house. This is where it gets bad. We continue walking home, 
crossing the final crosswalk before my block, so I turned my head because I didn't see him pass us. Lo and behold, he's crawling along the road trying to match our pace with his vehicle. He began trying to get us to stop. At this point, my heart is racing. I was even more scared because I was responsible for my friend. We began running because this was truly terrifying. We didn't run long as I'm asthmatic and my friend was plus-sized, so the guy didn't struggle to stay hot on our trail. After what felt like an eternity, we stepped onto my driveway, but oh no, he wasn't done yet. He began pulling into my driveway. Before we had a chance to react, he was in park and opening his door. Luckily my mom was able to see this part of the encounter, as she was in the kitchen which had a direct view of our driveway, so she hurried out to meet us in the driveway and escorted us into the house. My mom came back to talk with him, but he panicked and drove off as fast as he could. Thank God my mom was there, because we might not have been able to make it to the door before he snatched us. So this takes place when I was around 17 and living with my parents. It was the weekend and I was chilling in my room while my parents were out grocery shopping. When I was home alone, I always made sure to lock the door, including a lock that could only be unlocked from the inside, which made me feel extra safe. Due to that, when I heard keys in the lock, I knew it was my parents and I immediately opened the door for them. At first I looked through the people to make sure it was them but I just stopped after a while and just assumed. Well, that day my parents came back early, and as usual I opened the door for them after hearing the keys in the door. Maybe 20 minutes after they came back, I was in my room when I heard a noise coming from the front door. I went to investigate, and it sounded like someone was inserting something into the lock, or at least trying to open the door with the wrong keys. I immediately warned my dad, who went to open the door, and we saw a man trying to open the door. My dad thought it was a confused neighbor and told him he got the wrong apartment, but the man didn't answer. He just stood there with a blank expression, staring at me. His whole demeanor gave me a bad feeling, and I told my dad to stop talking and close the door. After standing there for a few seconds and not responding, the man ran downstairs and left the building. My dad was amused and I just went back to what I was doing, but thinking back on it later in the day, I realized if my parents came back just 20 minutes later, I would have rushed to open the door to this man, thinking it was them. He obviously wasn't a confused neighbor since I never saw him in the building before and his reaction was so odd. I also realized that by taking the stairs, he avoided being seen by the camera facing the elevator. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night, and I always checked before opening the door after that. About a month ago, I started working in a nursing home near where I live. I gotta say, it's not a bad job if strong smells and putrid sights don't bother you. The residents here are usually sweet and lovable, although there are rude and grumpy people here as well. Who can really blame them though? They don't have many years left, and most of them don't get visitors anymore. It fulfills me to talk with them and give them someone to talk to, since their families are no longer around. All was going well here with this job, until they put me on the dementia wing. I always knew that I'd have to work in this wing. They bounce me around the floors pretty much wherever they need me. At first, it was just another normal day. I put together my cart and cleaned the floor. However, after I came back from my first 15 minutes break, I started getting very unsettled. I'm not sure what caused this trigger, but if I had to guess, it was because I was too tired to really take in how creepy this side of the facility is. The rooms are strewn about almost randomly, 
as if they were trying to pack as many people in here as possible. The residents here are often grey and gloomy, missing hair and teeth. I walked along the crowded halls, cleaning room by room, really taking in these people's lives and trying to piece together some story. What unnerved me more were the rooms without a lot of possessions. As if someone simply said, they're so far gone, why would they need a lot of stuff? Broken clocks that no longer work or were set to a very wrong time, as if to really pound it into my head that most of these men and women have no concept of time anymore. The overhead lights that drone on, the rectangular boxes that house a reminder of the back rooms in a vague sense. This reminder was greatly heightened in the residents' bathrooms, where the buzzing was harsher, louder, more vivid, I turned off, I don't know how many lights in these bathrooms, to ease myself a bit more. The walls are a pinkish tan color. This was the biggest reminder yet. For some reason, the colors seemed to fit perfectly with the unsettling atmosphere. The staff were even creepy in a sense. The way they weren't put off by it, they even seemed joyful. It made me feel more out of place there. I wanted to go home, but... I'm not a weak-minded person by any means, but something about this atmosphere was making it incredibly uncomfortable, like I was a ghost walking through these halls. Now there's only about 10 to 15 rooms left. I pulled my cart into a big open alcove in the hallway where most of the residents were sitting in wheelchairs, as none of them had the strength to walk anymore, staring mindlessly at a TV playing cute videos of animals assumingly to put these residents at ease. However, this one thing that made me feel comfort quickly turned to dread. It was off-putting. This was the one good aspect of this wing of the nursing home, as if it didn't belong on the television. Their eyes, they looked at me with such sorrow, as if to say help me without saying anything at all. I'm not really sure how many of them can actually speak, some of them look at me and ask, where am I? And I'm at a loss as I don't know how to answer in a way they'll understand. Then, the screaming, the cries for help, the yelling for anyone to come comfort them, yelling out blood-curdling screams when the nurses remotely touch them in any way. I just have to watch as I'm just a janitor who cleans the rooms. No, their homes. I'm not allowed to touch the patients. No way to give comfort other than words, when they can barely hear, let alone process what I'm saying. This wing is so incredibly unnerving and sad. Listening and watching all this does remind me of a piece of art known as Everywhere at the End of Time. And I feel as if this experience is only more unnerving, having prior knowledge to this sad piece of art. The worst part of it all, all this could easily be any one of us when we get old. Not knowing what's real and what isn't, and crying out for loved ones who aren't there, and will never come. Being a Good Samaritan put me and my three-year-old daughter in danger. Here is my story. I'm a single mom of a three-year-old girl. I'm so blessed that I have the most amazing parents who live about 20 minutes away from me, who keep her when I need them to. I live in the city next to their rural area, and you have to go down a curvy, wooded rural road to get to their house out in the country. My little girl had spent the night with them the night before, and I headed out to their house the next day around lunchtime to eat with them and bring her back to our house. It was a pretty day, sunny, a lot of bikers out though, so I was on high alert driving there, as anyone speeding and not paying attention could easily hit a biker, which is a big fear of mine. I got there fine, ate lunch with them, and was headed back to my house driving on the rural road, which I know like the back of my hand and typically speed on. 
knowing when to slow down and take certain curves and that kind of thing. My little girl requested I put on her favorite songs in the car, so I was kind of watching her sing as she sat in her car seat in the back of the car through my rearview mirror. As we drove back home, I caught a glimpse of something blue up ahead, just on the edge of the woods near the road. I was going quite fast enough that the image didn't quite set in as I approached then passed it, but right after passing it, my brain finally processed that it was a blue, older car. It was flipped upside down and was rammed into a tree. The road was empty with only one house near, and there weren't any ambulances or cars near, so at first I was like, what the hell? Truly, the wreck didn't look like it had just happened, but I knew something was wrong in my gut. I pulled my phone out and called 911 as I kept driving, not fully processing that this had just happened. This is 911, what's your emergency? Hey, yeah. I'm driving down Colton Road near Burlington. I just passed a blue car flipped upside down. It looks like they ran into a tree. There wasn't anyone visible near the car and no other cars around. I'm not sure if I was the first person on scene or what. What is your exact location? Is there a house close to the wreck? Try to find the nearest address. I'm sending an ambulance out now. Was anyone visibly hurt or present at the scene? No, I didn't see anyone when I passed, but I'm not sure. I didn't get a really good look. I'm about two minutes down the road past the car now. Let me turn around and go back. I have my three-year-old girl in the car with me, just letting you know. I don't necessarily want her to see anything traumatizing, but I'll do what I need to do if I find anyone. The car looks really bad. It's okay. Don't get out of the car. Keep your doors locked. Just see if you can find the nearest address. I will stay on the phone with you the whole time. I turned around in the nearest driveway to me and drove back, speeding with my heart beating fast. As I now realized, someone clearly might be severely hurt, and I had just passed them by, not thinking I was the first to arrive on the scene. I was scared, but in action mode ready to deal with what I was potentially about to see inside the vehicle. When I got to the house I thought was closest to the wreck, the conversation picked back up with the operator. Okay, I think I'm almost at the car. I see a mailbox coming up right here. Hang on. Okay, it's 525 Winslow Road. That is the house a little less than a mile from the car. I'm headed from Burlington going towards Arlington and I see the car right here coming up on my left, across from the sandpit looking area. It's a blue, older, four-door car. Okay, great. An ambulance was just dispatched to it. It won't be long before they get there. Do you see anyone in or near the vehicle? Oh my god. Wait, yes. I see a man 25 to 30. He's standing in the middle of the road. I pull up next to the man with my doors locked rolled my window down with my phone still to my ear and 911 listening to me speak. I immediately say, Oh my god, are you okay? Is that your car? The guy is slurring his words a little, clearly very injured, but still standing and not in critical condition. He says, Yeah, I'm fine. That's when I notice a large wound on the side of his head with blood all over it. Oh my god, you're bleeding. You aren't okay. I'm on the phone with 911 right now. They're sending an ambulance. Don't move. I hear the 911 operator asking me if he was okay or if he was hurt in my ear. I say no he isn't. He's bleeding from his head, but he's standing in the road. I see the guy's face go from concerned about getting help to fully panicked and flat. He says, is that 911 on the phone? Hang up. I need you to drive me up the road right now. Hang up the phone. The operator hears him say this and she says, is your daughter in the vehicle with you? Yes, I can't drive this man anywhere. I'm not letting him in my car, especially with my little girl in here. Meanwhile, my daughter is silent in the back seat, taking everything happening in. That's when I look down and notice this man isn't wearing any shoes. He's standing barefoot and there's this large wet stain on his blue jeans, which I immediately realize is urine. I can smell alcohol on him, 
and he isn't even standing that close to me. I work in the medical field, and I deal with traumatic brain injury patients often. So I immediately wondered if maybe he had some kind of brain damage from the impact, and I began telling the operator, Oh no, he isn't okay, I think he's hurt. I look at the man, staying as calm and matter-of-fact as I can, and I tell him, I'm so sorry, but I can't drive you anywhere. My little girl is in the back seat, and I don't feel comfortable doing that. I didn't see anyone in the vehicle when I passed, so I'd already called 911. I think you need to let them come. I can't let you in my car, but I will park over here and make sure you're okay until they get here. The man is visibly panicked and now angry. He starts yelling, Tell them not to come. Hang up the phone. My heart literally stopped beating. I began slowly and gently pressing the gas, rolling past him to indicate I'm leaving. The 911 operator in my ear says, Pretend to tell me not to come. Pretend to hang up with me, but keep me on the line. So that's exactly what I do. Hey, I think he's okay. He says he doesn't need any medical help. He lives really close to here, so actually don't send the ambulance out. Sorry for the miscommunication. Okay, thanks so much. And I fake hanging up the phone. I set my phone face down in the passenger seat and tell him that I was going to go now, but that I hoped he was going to be okay. That's when I notice his pocket bulging with something silver peeking out. I knew right then that this man was armed and I had to get the hell out of there. I smiled and said I was sorry I couldn't help then quickly rolled up my window and sped off, turning around further down the road and passing him again at 65 to 70 miles per hour on a 45 mile per hour road. I was crying hysterically, and I pick up the phone to tell the 911 operator what just happened. She said, It's okay, you did the right thing. You played it cool and appeased him. We have the address and the ambulance is less than 5 minutes away. As she asked me for my name and identifying information, I see and hear sirens further up ahead. Thank God for that 911 operator coaching me through the situation. I still don't know what happened to the man, but I do know that he was clearly intoxicated, dangerous, and fully panicked, which is a scary combination that will make people do things without thinking clearly in an instant. My little girl asked, Mommy, was that man hurt? I saw a boo-boo on his head. I just said, Yeah, he's okay. He got a boo-boo. I think he was playing and bumped into a tree. A nurse is going to give him a band-aid. I sure am glad we could help him. She was satisfied and smiled, continuing to listen to the music and sing when I turned the radio back on. A terrifying and creepy-ass encounter, to say the least. This happened in the early 2000s when I was around 9 to 10. A large majority of my family decided to visit my elderly aunt in Waco, Texas. She lived in a bad part of town, but due to how my family was, it didn't bother any of us. It was about 11pm and everyone was in the living room singing along to the musical on television, lounging around on blanket pallets and pajamas and enjoying each other's company. When I say the living room was full is an understatement. We were practically on top of each other, but it didn't spoil our fun. What did spoil our fun was the front door opening slowly. Everyone immediately went silent because number one, we were not expecting anyone, and number two, the only other person with a key to my aunt's house was her son, who was in another state on business. What I now know as the barrel of a rifle began coming through the door with a person peeking around. As soon as I saw the person's eyes, they immediately yanked the gun back and said, Oh, I'm sorry. I have the wrong house. I'm looking for a friend. They closed the door and took off. Nobody moved, blinked, or exhaled for at least a minute. At the time, I didn't know how close my family came to death. As soon as everyone came to their senses, 
My elderly aunt made record time locking and bolting her door. No one slept easy that night. My aunt never moved out of that house or neighborhood, despite her son begging and even offering to have her move in with him. She says, I'm not letting some wannabe gangster scare me out of my house. I wish I had the balls she did. This happened a few years ago, and I still find myself thinking about it sometimes. Maybe it was nothing, but the feeling in my gut says there's no way. For context, I'm an adult and have been for quite some time, but I do look much younger than I am. I was traveling in Texas with my uncle and grandfather, who were in the driver and front seat. I was in the back. We were going down a highway when a large red pickup truck leveled with us. No other vehicles close enough to be visible in either direction. I think we were maybe 30 or so minutes east of Abilene. The man in the pickup looked tall and lean, Caucasian with brown hair, and just stubble as far as facial hair. So he leveled with our truck, but made and held eye contact with me. His expression was, Ugh, I get chills thinking of it. He was smiling but there was something really off about it. He most likely thought I was a teenager. I don't have the words to articulate it, but when this man met my gaze, I felt myself go cold and my stomach sank hard. I just felt very deeply in my soul that this man was evil, that he'd done terrible things, and was imagining doing something awful to me. He stayed next to us for about a mile, it made no sense, and quite brazen with two men in the front seat, in a state where it isn't unusual for people to carry firearms. My family didn't think too much of it, but they have a very small town, nothing bad would ever happen to us mentality, and are generally dismissive of anything like that. Maybe it's silly, but I wouldn't be surprised if I see that man in the news someday for some kind of atrocity against young women. I've never told this story because it scared me so much, but now that I'm older and have experienced even more scary shit in my adult life, I figured I might as well share it. I was about 12 or 13 years old, I don't remember the exact age, but I was living with my father in his apartment, so it had to have been around that time. My father was at work, and I was in the living room eating the dinner that my dad had left for me in the fridge. I began hearing knocking sounds coming from down the hall in the apartment complex. Knocking, then a few moments of silence, and then footsteps, as if someone was going door to door looking for someone or selling something. Eventually this person made their way to my door. I heard the knock, but didn't answer at first. My father always told me, never let anybody inside when he wasn't home. However, I was a naive kid and thought that this person might need help of some kind. So, I opened the door. There was a middle-aged man in a brown sweater, medium-length gray hair, with a thick salt and pepper beard relatively normal looking, standing in my doorway. As soon as he saw me open the door, it was like his eyes lit up with excitement in a twisted way. Hey bud, is your mommy here? The man asked. No, my mom doesn't live here. Oh, well how about your daddy? No, he's working right now, I responded. Keep in mind, I was 13 and hadn't referred to my parents as mommy and daddy in quite some time, so that struck me as odd right away. But maybe I looked younger at the time. I don't know. Ah, I see. Well, maybe you can help me out with something real quick. My granddaughter lives here too, but I can't find her. Do you mind helping me look for her? Sorry, I'm not supposed to leave when my dad's not here but I haven't seen anyone, I told him. 
He gave me an eerie look of disapproval and walked away without saying anything. I shrugged it off and locked the door, then turned the TV on and sat down on the couch. About 20 minutes later, I heard someone jiggling the doorknob. I thought it was my dad, but then I remembered he wasn't supposed to be home for another couple of hours. Then I heard knocking and someone saying, Come on, let me in. It was the same man's voice. He continued to repeat himself, saying that if I helped him look for his granddaughter, he'd buy me a toy or give me money or buy me ice cream. And the tone in his voice became more and more aggressive. I was freaking out by this point. After a few minutes of this, one of my neighbors was entering the complex and saw what was happening. He must have scared the guy off. All I heard was a bunch of who the fuck are you, and get the fuck out of here. I never told my dad about this, and I never saw the man again. I don't know who he was, where he came from, or how he even got into the apartment complex to begin with. A few years back, I was living with my aunt and uncle after moving to a new state. They just moved into a new home in a new subdevelopment. In this area, door-to-door -door salesmen swarm new developments and new bills for water softeners, cleaning supplies, solar panels, generators, and the Kirby vacuum people. They wander the neighborhood all day knocking on doors, but were usually gone by around 5 p.m. This particular evening, I was home alone with my dog, a mutt who was mostly black lab and an unknown mixture. He was roughly the size and weight of a full breed Labrador, but he had a stockier build and long wiry hair. He was a gentle, sweet baby who was upset if someone spoke harshly to him. I'd never known him to be threatening to anyone. My aunt and uncle were out celebrating their anniversary. This time of year, the days were getting longer and we would have full dark by around 8pm. It was around 7pm and starting to get dusky when someone rang the doorbell and knocked on the door. The door was one of those with a thick glass oval window and I could see the door and who was there from the kitchen. I was going to ignore them, but unfortunately they could see me and continued to knock, so I went to answer the door. My dog followed me, but stood off to the side in the shadows of the dining room. The person at the door was a young man about college age, and dressed in a college shirt and tie and khakis. He looked a bit like a Mormon missionary with style. He was thin and about my height at 5'8 to 5'9. I figured he was a salesman of some sort, but thought it was odd he was out this late in the day. I thought I'd open the door a crack tell him I'm not interested and then lock the door. I open the door a few inches to speak through it and he starts his spiel about Kirby vacuum cleaners and he wants to come in and give a demonstration. Number one, it's not my house. Number two, I know once they get in they're not leaving without selling something and I have no need for an overpriced vacuum. Besides, I don't have the thousand plus dollars to spend anyway. I tell him, no thank you, I'm not interested, and I begin to close the door when he puts his foot between the door and the door jam. He then throws his hands up to stop the door from closing. This is when I think, what the fuck, and I hear a vicious growl behind me to my right, and then three loud deep barks as my dog lunges for the door. I grab his collar to keep him from going out the door. The guy's mouth drops open. His eyes get really wide. He looks like he's ready to pass out or piss himself as he jumps back from the door saying, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, wrong house. Then he turns and runs to the end of the driveway where a car with three men in it pulls up to get him. They speed off with the tires squealing. I told my aunt and uncle about it when they got home and we told a few neighbors so they could keep an eye out for unusual behavior. It is possible they were a team of Kirby salesmen, 
They do travel in teams of four and follow the door knockers in the car with the vacuum. But I was suspicious because it was late in the day for them to be knocking on doors. And it was a team of four men. Usually they have a team with two or more women in the group because they're knocking on doors at any time of day when women are going to be home alone and unlikely to let strange men in. So, to a team of Kirby salesmen working late to meet quotas, or a team of home invaders, I don't know. But Cosmo wasn't going to take chances. This occurred in the winter of 2017. I'm a man in my 20s living alone in a studio apartment in a bad neighborhood at the time. It was a normal weekday night and I spent it indoors playing video games on my PlayStation 4 and smoking weed into the early morning. My lights were off and only the glare of the TV lit up the room slightly. All of a sudden, around 2am, I hear a knock at my door. I ignored it at first, thinking it was the game, but then I heard it again. I quickly paused the game and went over to the door quietly. I look out the people and said, Who is it? And the stranger responded by saying, It's the mailman. I go over to my window next to the door to get a better look. There obviously are no mailmen that deliver at 2am. I open the shutter slightly and saw a Caucasian man that looked like he was on drugs. He was holding a large black trash bag that looked as if it was full. I yelled at him in anger through the window. You're not a mailman. Piss off. He stood there for a moment, not even noticing that I'm looking right at him. Then he continues to wobble away slowly, dragging his heavy trash bag of God knows what. I didn't report this incident and never saw this creep again. So, quite a number of years ago, my cousin and I were on a summer break at her house playing 007 on the GameCube and just passing time when we heard what sounded like broken glass on tile. The TV was up pretty loud, so we paused it, tensely waiting for another sound. Then, we heard the sound of flip-flop sandals walking around in the kitchen area. So, my cousin called her mom. She asked my aunt, who was a nurse, if she was home from work yet. My aunt was not home, and of course, wanted to know why we were asking. Once we told her, she told us to crawl out of the window and run to the neighbors as quickly as we could, while she called the cops. The bedroom window luckily led to the backyard just next to the gate, so we got out of there. Fast forward an hour or so, and the cops informed my aunt that there had been an obvious break-in. The window on the back door had been broken, and there was a note left for my aunt. Now, my aunt had gotten into a serious relationship with this really nice guy. His name was Josh. Well, Josh's ex-wife, however, was not so nice. She had, at some point, followed my aunt home and found where she lived. She then proceeded to break in through the back door, rummage through a bunch of stuff, and leave a horrible note for my aunt. I can imagine what it said. From what I heard, she was arrested. I'm not sure if any charges were pressed, but she later ended her life, leaving behind her daughter and son, whom I both went to school with. I also later found out that she suffered from severe bipolar disorder and a couple of other things. Tragic, but I'm glad me and my cousin weren't caught up in her psychotic episode more than what we were. It still freaks me out to think about it. My story takes place 19 years ago. I'm a female and I was 16 at the time. I'm 5 foot 7, I was about 130 pounds, and I like to think that I'm strong, but I couldn't take on two young men. So, it begins with my mother and stepfather going away on vacation 
and leaving my 17-year-old sister and I home alone. They did this quite often. My parents were not winning any parenting awards. My sister and I didn't get along either. She was a nasty piece of work. Luckily, she decided to stay at a friend's house while my parents were away. I was nervous about being alone, so I had my boyfriend staying with me. He was a pugnacious dickhead, but I'm glad he was there. One night, Brett and I were at my house, and we had just started messing around when I heard a really loud knock at the door. My room was in the basement, but at the landing area between the stairs, there was a window that I could see the stairs that lead up to the alcove of our front porch. I could see two people standing there, and just as I was peeking out to see them better, one of them saw me. I remember feeling the breath sucked out of my chest. There were two young men standing on my porch. It was almost midnight, and I had no idea who the hell they were. The guy that saw me let his friend know, and they both looked in the window and asked me to come to the door. My boyfriend had gone upstairs to open the door, and I remember freaking out because I had told him not to. He was one of those guys that thought he was Mr. Tough Guy and believed he could fight anyone. He was telling the guys to leave just as I joined him at the door. They saw me and called me by my name. They asked me to let them in. Brett kindly told them to piss off. One guy, I think he said his name was Wes or Les or something like that, said, Come outside. We just want to talk to you to my boyfriend. No thanks, we're going to bed, I said, and I shut the door. I was really confused and getting very frightened. They stood on my doorstep for a few minutes, then started knocking again. The Wes or Les guy explained to me through the door that he was my sister's friend and that she had told him I was alone at home and that they should come by. I knew my sister and I believed them. That did not, however, make me stupid. I told them to leave. They then started kicking the door. It was shaking and I seriously feared that it would not hold up. I was so scared that I ran into my kitchen to call the police. I was assured that they would be there very soon and to lock the doors and stay on the phone. Meanwhile, Brett was still yelling at them, which only served to piss these guys off more. I begged him to shut up, but he wouldn't listen to me. I was locking all the doors and windows upstairs while Brett went down to check the doors. Down in the basement, there was a huge mud area and it had a thick wooden door made of two by four planks, kind of like a barn door. The door had a big old lock on it, some spring-loaded turnbolt, and also had a plank to set across it, kind of like a barricade. One of the guys was pounding on this door and Brett heard him tell the other guy to go try the back door. This stupid door was one of those 1960s things that had a happy little square window right at face level with a little curtain across it. I was at this door trying to jam a chair under the flimsy knob when I looked up and saw the unnamed guy just looking in at me. I screamed and the dispatcher asked me if I was okay. I barely squeaked out that one of the guys was looking right at me through the window. He was older than me, probably about 20, and he was tall. He looked scary as hell. His dark eyes were drilling into me, and he wore this creepy, placid smile on his face. I'd never seen this man before, but he knew my name. He tapped on the window with one finger, never breaking eye contact, and he said, Becky, let me in. I couldn't breathe. The knob was rattling as he was messing with it. He said again, Let me in, Becky. I just want to see if you're okay. I just want to talk. He stared at me. I didn't say anything. I was just three feet from him, with my back pressed to the fridge, when he suddenly started beating on the door and screamed. Let me in the house. If I have to break in, I will kill you both. So just open the door. He looked maniacal. 
Then there was a loud knock at the front door, and the man went silent. He gave me the most hateful sneer I'd ever seen. I heard shouting, and he ran down the back stairs into the woods along the back of my yard. Brett had gone to the door. It was the cops. There were two female officers at the door. One of them was starting to raise her voice, asking where I was when I came to the door, too. I was so relieved, I started sobbing. I told them they'd run away through the woods. Luckily, the woods were not deep. They actually ran along the bank of a large river, and there was a bridge just up from there where the woods met the road. One officer ran around the back, while one stayed to get a description and to take my statement. Officer number one came back and spoke to officer number two. She said she saw them running across the bridge. They both left in a hurry, hopped in the cruiser and sped off. I was still crying and shaking, but I was absolutely furious at Brett for riling them up. I went to make myself some tea, thinking of all the ways I could kill my sister when she got home. I had so much anger, fear, and adrenaline pumping through me, I could have ripped it to shreds at that moment. Twenty minutes later, the cruiser came back. There were two guys sitting in the back seat and the officers wanted me to confirm it was the right guys. I looked through the window and saw them. They still looked terrifying to me. They were in handcuffs and could not get to me, but I would not get too close to them. Neither would look at me. I confirmed it was them and we spoke a bit. I told the cops about my sister, suggesting that these two men should come and see me. Officer number two kind of mumbled. What a bitch. I had to agree. I pressed charges for attempted forcible entry, property damage, trespassing, disorderly conduct, and attempted assault. Initially, they both plead not guilty, but later admitted to some of the charges. They both got 18 months in jail and were forbidden to contact me or my boyfriend ever again, and they had to be at least 500 meters from me at all times. I never heard from them again. I confronted my sister about it, and of course she denied it, then laughed about it. Laughed at me. She was an awful person. I have no idea what their true intentions were, as they maintained that they were just there to talk to me. I'm thankful I didn't have to find out. So I live in a middle class neighborhood outside of a larger midwestern city. My neighbors are nice and very tight knit. We watch out for each other's pets, kids and vehicles. There's been reports of a prowler making the rounds on social media through late April and May. I tend to take these with a large grain of salt because this area skews older and they tend to be very paranoid about strangers. Let's cut to one night months ago. I was up later as usual on Saturday, playing through the Subnautica sequel. I play with headphones on my PC because it's very immersive. I got up to grab a beer from the fridge and plug in my phone to charge it. I have a roommate, but he's a long haul trucker and was on the road until the next week. As I went back to my PC, I noticed my back porch light was on. This isn't too unusual, as there's plenty of cats, possums, and other little animals around here. I still decided to check it out. I poke my head into my sunroom directly behind my PC room and see the outline of a tall adult at the glass back door. I shut the door and lock it. I'd momentarily freaked out and went to grab my phone. I hear someone try the sunroom door which thankfully was locked tight with a deadbolt, and I started to panic. I go to grab my handgun from the gun safe. In retrospect, I should have called 911 right then. I retrieve my firearm and go back to the sunroom. I see someone sulking off into the night, and a wave of relief washes over me. I come to my senses and call the police to report a potential break-in attempt, followed by my roommate, who luckily was getting a late dinner. I told my roommate what happened and asked him if anyone had told him they were stopping by. 
He laughed and told me that someone definitely just tried to break in, and no one he knew would drop by unannounced at midnight and just start trying doors. Anyway, the police show up about five minutes later and ask the usual questions. They then relate to me that the reported prowler on Facebook is very much real and that they'd broken into several homes and vehicles in the area. They told me to call them right away if anything like that happens again and to make sure my windows, doors, and truck are locked up tight. It's a freaky encounter and it has definitely made me feel very uneasy. It was a few years ago. I was home alone at night in my bedroom. I was just chilling on my bed and I started to sing. And as it was summer, I'd left the door to my balcony wide open to let the fresh air in. Then, for some reason, I heard some noises coming from outside, like as if someone walked in the garden. I wasn't sure at the time if it was my cat or my parents simply coming home until I turned my head to the balcony door. I saw a pair of hands belonging to some guy trying to climb my balcony. I panicked after seeing it and yelled, Is there someone there? Then the guy fell off and said, Oh, sorry. It's just that me and my friends heard you singing and we thought you were in danger. So I decided to check if everything was okay. And then he headed off. I still don't know what that was. Maybe due to the fact that the house next to ours was used as vacation lodging, the guy and his friends probably just booked the house for a few days, but I'm not really sure. And still, if he was truly worried, then why did he try to climb my balcony instead of simply knocking on the front door? I'm 28, and I'm a woman who lives alone in a town next to the town I grew up in. Anyone who knows this town wouldn't even think twice about it being a dangerous place. Before what I'm about to tell you, I never felt compelled to lock my car or my doors. I moved into my apartment in October 2021. Two months later, I hear some seriously strange noises through my wall. These noises only happened after 2 a.m., they sent shivers down my spine. Bangs, whistles, jumbled words, moaning, yelling. One time I heard, help me, help me. Long story short, and after many, many 911 calls, I was informed that I live next to a known meth user in the area. This man is also a lawyer. Nuts. I moved from that unit to a different unit in the farthest apartments from the main entrance. I've been in this new unit for about five-ish months. I never hear my neighbors. I see them and I try not to be judgmental, but as humans, we just are. There's a couple that seems strange, but nothing truly out of the ordinary. It's quiet in this part of the apartment because of it being the last in the string of buildings, and knowing how far back I am. It's comforting knowing no one who doesn't live here shouldn't be here. One night, a little after 2am, I'm half asleep watching TV. I hear three raging bangs on my patio door. The adrenaline rush I felt was unbelievable. I went into panic mode. My bed is feet from my patio door, and if you're on my patio, you can see into my apartment through the sliver of blinds. This person saw me but I'll never know how long they were there before they knocked. The bang sounded like it came from someone in need of dire help. They sounded like they came from a man's fist, someone angry. I jump out of bed. My dog starts barking incessantly. I peep through the blinds, but it's too dark to see the person's face. It was a middle-aged woman, short, rather frail. I managed to understand the words, Do you have a minute? The bangs didn't match the demeanor of her request. That's the eeriest part for me. It was incredibly unsettling. I say, Hell no. Who are you? Get out of here. Between the chaos of my dog and me screaming for her to leave, 
I couldn't hear anything else she said. Then, she just stood there, in darkness, for about ten seconds, and then turns and jogs away and yells to me, Wrong house. I call the police. They arrive and inform me that the woman I saw is my neighbor, and that she has schizophrenia and sometimes doesn't take her medication. Same with her boyfriend, who also lives with her. How ironic that it's the same people who I thought were strange. I always wonder what she would have wanted to talk about. Needless to say, my first apartment and living alone experience has really gotten off to a great start. I guess a bit of backstory might help. I work from home, I live with my fiance, but she's gone throughout the day to attend the nearby university. I'm home to work all day. Today, just as any other, I was reading a bit on Reddit, catching up on news and so on, before I got started working for the day. I didn't have any music on or anything, so I'm not sure how I did not hear what would happen next. Apparently at some point, this random guy decided, for whatever reason, to try our doorknob. Clearly it was left unlocked, as otherwise I would not be telling this. So, this guy somehow manages to do this without me hearing. He opens the door, gets into the house and closes it, all without me hearing a creak or anything. While I'm still not entirely sure, this recollection of events tells me that he may have deliberately been entering my house, and perhaps even trying to do so quietly. So, I have no idea that there's some guy in my house. I'm sitting in my office reading Reddit when I hear the door to the room I'm in opening. It was just about time for my fiancé to be home for lunch, so naturally I imagined it was her. Now, many times, I don't even bother to look back at her when she's coming in. For some reason, that day, I did look back, but I was not met with the gaze of my fiancé. I was met instead with some random guy standing in my doorway, as if he believed it was his own place or something. For a couple of seconds, my mind blanked as it was resolving exactly what to do about the situation. The guy didn't seem inherently threatening or harmful, but you can never be too careful. Looking back, the entire situation was threatening in and of itself, because not only did some random guy enter my home, but then proceed to explore my house, so to speak. And when he found me, he did not react in any reasonable way. He just stood there, not making eye contact, repeating, Sorry, I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. You also should know at this point that I'm entirely naked. So my first reaction is just embarrassment and the idea that I can't get up and have him see me naked. And with this predicament of being entirely naked and not wanting to be seen in such a state, rather than doing what I would have done in any other situation, I inquired, Who the hell are you? Moving forward a bit, I've repeated my question. I'm glaring at this man, telling him to get out of the house now. This all happened very fast. I kept repeating things along the general line of thought, and he would mumble, I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. After a few times, I started to legitimately feel scared. This guy has not only entered the incorrect house, or worse, intentionally entered my house for nefarious reasons, but is now seemingly ignoring my request that he leaves and failing to answer who he is or why he's there. At this point, the adrenaline takes over and you no longer feel embarrassment or fear of that kind or any other. You snap into a state of, well, don't know why this guy's here, but he's not going to leave unless I do something, and I'm going to do something or die trying. I jumped out of my chair, grabbed a cheap fold-up chair next to my desk, and wielded it at him, jabbing it toward him. I figured maybe he was just insane and needed an incentive to get out, which by this time, I was quite glad to be giving him. He had me all wound up at this point and I was seriously about ready to start hurting. I never did hurt or hit him, of which I'm proud, 
but truthfully, he got very lucky. Many people would have not hesitated at all to do that or worse. Never in my life did I once expect that I'd have to corral an unwanted man out of my house while naked. It was truly a bizarre experience. So one Friday, I was home alone while my family stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone, as this exact scenario is very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I'm used to the odd creaks and settling noises of our house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night and most noises could be attributed to him. And if anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the door or windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12 a.m. were disconcerting to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I am still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long and I finally got out of bed and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment, until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep, and I saw the door open about two or three inches. I froze. I'd let our dog Bosco out earlier that night, but I know I closed the door. I'd never left this door open, I'm a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like, so I would never, home alone, forget to close the door. I am 100% certain. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts, or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open, because I knew it would send me into a spiral, possibly even an anxiety or panic attack if I didn't explain this away. I closed and locked the door, double checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, I looked around the entire second floor of my three floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease. And upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. As I was down there, trying to push away the fear, I could hear Bosco walking around on the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2am the same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few minutes before this to Bosco in the basement, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in and we let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days, and forgot to mention it to anyone. My sister and mom were home with me for movie night while my dad and brother stay at the cabin. I remember the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again, the same door that was locked from the inside and not open since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she let Bosco out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. 
Then we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then this hypothetical person would be trapped up there now, knowing that this house was not empty, and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister was in the bathroom, they ran out of the glass door, which is perfectly timed to when they found the door open once more much wider than when I found it, as though they were only in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the doorframe. Either way, it ties together too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins without nothing missing, vandalizing or just breaking and entering so many, many times. So it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this, and I'm shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I slept, all alone in the basement. There's a part of me that doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. I certainly am glad that my searching came up empty that night and I did not meet this person face to face. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. I'd like to thank my channel members and patrons for the support. Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Janice, Borderline Betty, Brooke, Wendy, ADHD Aurora, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Dracard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Stacy, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Samantha, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Erin, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Fire 05, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, and Alex. I will see you on the next one.